Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. You sit down at your desk to work on an important project, but an email notification on your phone sidetracks you. You're in the middle of deep work when someone pops into your office to talk. Sometimes our days seem like an endless stream of distractions. What would be possible if you had the power to stay focused in the face of distractions? In his book, Indistractable, Former Stanford lecturer and behavioral design expert Nir Eyal reveals the hidden psychology driving us to distraction. And it's not as simple as swearing off your devices. In our conversation, Nir shares why time management is really pain management, the reason you need to get rid of your to-do list, and the approach that will help you better manage your email. His four-step research-packed model will help you finally do what you say you will do. If you enjoy this episode, share it with a friend, and don't forget to leave a rating or review to help others discover the show. Let's jump right in. Here's my conversation with Nir Eyal. Nir, what a treat to have you on. Thank you so much. You're busy for taking a minute. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So before we get into your new book, Indistractable, can can you share a little bit about your, you know, your background? Because I think your experience in Silicon Valley is important context uh, for people as we begin to talk about the book. Sure, absolutely. So let's see. So my background is I've helped start two tech companies, uh, the second of which was at the intersection of gaming and advertising. And this was back in 2007. Before apps meant iPhone apps, the Apple App Store hadn't been been, uh, released yet. And so we were working with Facebook apps. And it was in that business at the intersection of gaming and advertising that I had this front row seat to learn from the most sticky, engaging, habit-forming products on earth, uh, Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and Slack and Snapchat. And I really wanted to understand how was it that these companies make their products so engaging. And the idea was that if we could harness the psychology of how to make those products so engaging, maybe the rest of us in business could use the same techniques to build healthy habits. And that's exactly what's, what's happened. Uh, my first book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, which came out of a course I taught at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, is all about how companies can make their products the kind of products that people use because they want to, not because they feel like they have to. Mm. Right? What if we could make healthcare products and SaaS software and all kinds of boring products and services, something that people actually want to engage with. And we wouldn't have to waste all that money on advertising and spammy marketing messages if we design them in the same way that these tech giants do. That was the real goal, was to steal those secrets and to democratize them. And that's exactly what's happened. So the past five years, uh, companies like Fitbod, for example, uh, use the hook model to get people hooked to exercising in the gym. Uh, Kahoot, a company I like so much, I actually invested in the company. It's the world's largest educational software in the world. Uh, This company helps kids get hooked to in-classroom learning. Uh, Some of my clients include the New York Times. I help them get people hooked to reading the news. And so there's all kinds of ways that we can use the same psychology to build habit-forming products. But then, of course, the downside of products that are designed to be so engaging, and, and frankly, very few people, if anyone listening to this podcast right now, are building that sort of product that people get too engaged to. Uh, you know, it's very hard for people to become addicted to SaaS software or <laughs> or some kind of enterprise services. But you know, the fact is that that some of the case studies in the book, like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp, uh, even Slack and email, sometimes we overuse to the point that they cause distraction. And so, knowing what I know about the deeper psychology of how these products are designed. I figured it would be very helpful if uh, if I could give an insider's perspective as to the Achilles heel of distraction. You know, in this age when we have so many fantastic technologies and devices, I think it behooves us to understand how we can get the best out of these technologies without letting them get the best of us. Mm-hmm. No question. It's an amazing book. And you talk a lot about, obviously, some of the the misconceptions and the myths 
about distraction in the book and some of the triggers, and we'll break that down a little bit. But what are some of the biggest misconceptions and myths, you know, about distractions? Probably the biggest is that it's somehow a new phenomenon. Yeah. That it's uh, Facebook and the iPhone and Slack and email that, that created distraction. And in fact, I, I found, you know, 2,500 years ago, Plato talked about akrasia, this tendency that we all have to do things against our better interest. And Plato, literally 2,500 years ago, was saying, boy, isn't the world such a distracting <laughs> place? And in fact, the world has always been a distracting place. Now, that being said, the fact that technology today is so pervasive and so persuasive means that if you are looking for a distraction, then clearly you're going to find it. But the fact is that, that the same principles that help us get distraction in its place v- with, with any medium can be used today. That you know we shouldn't just think about tech distraction. You know, one of my I think another myth is that distraction by technology is only about these you know things that people think are frivolous, watching YouTube videos, playing Candy Crush. But actually, my research reveals that some of the most pernicious distractions in the workplace, the number one source of distraction, according to surveys of American knowledge workers, the number one source is not anything on your computer. It's not anything on your cell phone. The number one source of distraction, according to 80% of people who were surveyed, said the number one source of distraction was other people. Wow, interesting. People stopping by your desk in an open floor plan office, uh, superfluous meetings, stupid emails that don't need to get sent. All of those things, in fact, are the, 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 the most prevalent cause of distraction. And then one more prevalent myth, I think, that's really important to understand. So in the book, I talk about the way to understand distraction is to understand the opposite of distraction. So the opposite of distraction, think about this for a minute. What's the opposite of distraction? Most people say it's focus, mm-hmm. but I disagree. That in fact, the opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction that both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull, and they both end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do, things that you do with intent. The opposite of uh, of traction is distraction, anything that pulls you away from what you plan to do. So why is this so important? Because what we find is, is, is such a pernicious source of distraction are these things that we think are productive. Let me give you an example. This used to happen every day in my life before I wrote this book. I would sit down at my desk and I would say, okay, now I'm going to work on that big project. I'm going to work on the thing that I've been procrastinating on. Here I go. I'm going to write that big presentation. I'm going to finish that big report. Here I go. But let me check email first, (laughs) right? How many times has this happened to us? And here's the thing. Distraction tricks us. It makes us think that, hey, email is something I got to do anyway, right? That's kind of productive. In fact, it's, call, it's what we call pseudo work, because if it's not what you plan to do with your time, it is just as much of a pernicious distraction. I would argue even more so because you don't realize that you've gotten distracted. So what happens is we prioritize the urgent at the expense of the important. And so anything can be a distraction if we're not careful. Mm. What is the root of it, right? What is the root of distraction, which is where you start in, in the book? Such a great question. So there's, there's basically two sources of distraction, two things that prompt us to take action. So what we have is what we call the external triggers, the pings, the dings, the rings, all of these things in our outside environment can prompt us to either traction, something we want to do, or distraction, something we don't want to do. But in fact, those external triggers are not the most prevalent cause of distraction. It turns out from a time study perspective, the number one source of distraction, as bad as your colleagues and the pinging and dinging of your cell phone might be, in fact, more distraction does not start from outside of us, but in fact begins from within us. Wow. And this is something you don't read about in any other productivity book on this topic that I've ever seen, is that in fact, the root cause of distraction are what we call internal triggers. And that's why it's so important to focus on this. Before you do getting things done or whatever productivity technique you you work on, you have to first work on yourself in terms of this fact. Everything we do, everything you do, is prompted by one thing. Now, most people, when when they try and answer this question of what, what is the nature of human motivation, why do we do what we do, they're going to give you some version of carrots and sticks, right? That everything we do is about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. This is called Freud's pleasure principle. But in fact, it's not true. That neurologically speaking, we do not do things for the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. In fact, everything we do for one reason only, 
And that is the desire to escape discomfort. The desire to escape discomfort. Everything we do is about this desire to escape discomfort, even the pursuit of pleasurable sensations, wanting, craving, lusting. There's a reason we say love hurts Mm. because neurologically that is exactly what is going on. So what this means, if all human behavior is prompted by a desire to escape discomfort, that means that time management is pain management. We have to fundamentally learn this skill that procrastination, distraction, doing the things that we didn't say we were going to do or not doing the things we said we were going to do is fundamentally, as much as we don't want to admit it, an emotion regulation problem. When we feel lonely, we check Facebook. When we're uncertain, we Google. When we're bored, we check stock prices, sports scores, the news, Pinterest, Reddit, whatever. We are doing this because we want to feel something else. And if corporate America doesn't wake up and understand this, that this is the root cause of distraction, we keep blaming the proximal causes. We blame email. We blame Slack. We blame our bosses. We blame this. We blame that. The fact is we have to upgrade our tool set so that when we feel these uncomfortable triggers, we do things that bring us traction as opposed to leading us towards distraction. So what are some of the practical ways we can start to recognize these internal triggers? Absolutely. So the first step is to what I call master the internal triggers. And there's basically three big things we can do. We can reimagine the trigger, reimagine the task, and reimagine our temperament. So let me give you something very, very practical that I describe in the book. And this, by the way, I I can't stand these personal productivity self-help books where it's all about, oh, here's my personal anecdote for what works for me. No, no, no. That's (laughs) that's not the kind of book I like to read. Uh, Everything in the book is backed by peer-reviewed studies. There's 20 pages of citations. And one of the techniques that I draw from acceptance and commitment therapy is called the 10-minute rule. And this has been around for decades, and it's very, very effective. The idea here is when you find that you are about to get distracted, psychologists tell us that the best thing you can do is, number one, write down that emotional sensation. What is it that you are experiencing that you are looking to escape from? If, if sitting with your family... Uh, and 10 minutes later, you can't help but check your phone because of the emails or pinging and ding or whatever. Let me tell you, it's not the phone. There's something going on inside of you. There's some kind of emotion. I know it's kind of icky and sticky, but we have to face that emotion. What is it that we are looking to escape from? If you can write that down, that's a huge step forward to great, gaining, uh, gaining greater agency and control over that sensation and not letting it control you. So step one is write down that sensation. So sometimes I'll have... Uh, On my desk, in the book, there's actually what's called a distraction tracker. And so you can pull it out of the book. I put it right on my desk. And you can write down in a particular time, here's what I felt. Now, the next job is to explore that sensation with curiosity rather than contempt. Because what most people do when it comes to distraction, they fall into two buckets. We have what we call the blamers or the shamers. The blamers, they say, oh, it's my phone, it's the email, it's Slack. It's, you know, they blame something outside themselves. And then you have the shamers. This is the category I used to fall into. The shamers say, oh, you see, I must be deficient somehow. You see, I, maybe I'm lazy. Maybe I have a short attention span. Maybe there's something wrong with me. I, maybe I'm an imposter in this job. I'm no good at it. And we shame ourselves. And of course, what does that do? The more we shame ourselves, the worse we feel, the more internal triggers, the more likely we are to seek escape with distraction. So that doesn't work either. Sure. Instead, what we want to do is to be claimers. Claimers claim responsibility, acknowledging that this stuff isn't your fault. You didn't invent Facebook. You didn't invent email. You didn't invent Slack. This stuff, you didn't create this stuff, but it is your responsibility. And so by claiming responsibility, we explore that sensation with curiosity rather than contempt. And so here's how the 10-minute rule works. You know the sensation. You take out a timer, your phone, whatever. And many times I'll just say straight to my phone, you know, set the timer for 10 minutes. I'll put the phone down. And my job for 10 minutes is I have two choices. I can either get back to the task at hand or for those 10 minutes, explore the sensation with curiosity rather than contempt. Talking to myself like a good friend, acknowledging what is it that I'm experiencing right now. And guess what? If that timer runs out, I can give into that distraction. I can Google whatever it is I want to Google or email the thing I know I'm not supposed to email right now or, or eat that chocolate cake or smoke that cigarette, whatever it might be. I can give in in just 10 minutes of surfing the urge, of feeling that sensation. And it turns out that nine times out of 10, 
you'll get back to the task at hand before the timer runs out. Very simple technique, doesn't cost anything. It's one of dozens I describe in the book that anyone can use today to become more indistractable. And so what if the task that you need to lean into is more than 10 minutes and then the timer goes off in 10 minutes? Do people keep going and hit sort of end on that timer or do they go, oh, cool, now I can go do that other thing? Right. So you can keep doing whatever you were doing. Uh, so for example, for me, you know, I've always, I used to be clinically obese. Now I'm at about 12% body fat, but for me, I would use this technique whenever I'm tempted still to this day, whenever I'm tempted to eat something I know I shouldn't eat. So I see that chocolate cake and I say, Oh, I really want that chocolate. Cake. Let me just eat it. But first let me surf the urge. If after 10 minutes, yeah, I can eat the chocolate cake. The, the reason this technique is so effective is that strict abstinence backfires. Got it. So typically you don't go eat that chocolate cake in 10 minutes. That's what I'm sort of... Right. Got it. Right. After 10 minutes, yeah, you don't feel that You avoid it. Anymore. Okay, that got internal it. internal trigger is gone. Exactly. And what you're doing, by the way, what you're doing is that you are telling, you are reshaping your self-image. You know, long-term behavior change is identity change. And so when we keep giving in to these distractions, we're reinforcing our identity as, oh, there you see, I still couldn't avoid distraction. I gave in again. What a loser. And you keep reinforcing this identity as opposed to when you prove to yourself that you're indistractable, that becomes your new identity. Do you feel like there aren't enough hours in the day? Do burnout and exhaustion feel inevitable? Do you struggle to prioritize the things that matter most? If this sounds like you, then join me for a free live webinar, The Energized Leader, on Tuesday, June 30th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. In 45 minutes, I'll walk you through the key principles from my book, The Energy Clock, so you can take control of your energy and your life. Stop micromanaging your time and instead start focusing on where you are investing your energy. To reserve your seat, visit energizedleadertraining.com. That's energizedleadertraining.com. See you soon. And in part two, it's titled Make Time for Traction. So it's it's not just about avoiding distraction, which is which is where a lot of people start. How does you know planning right tie into all of this? How do, how does planning tie into traction? Yeah, absolutely. So this leads into why I don't like to do lists, and I know I'm I'm sacrificing a sacred cow. Everybody knows the importance of to do lists, right? Sure. Well, I would argue that to do lists for most people backfire because they're not using them correctly. Uh, because what the, the the average person using a to do list today, you know, it, by the way, most people don't even keep they keep a to do list. But those who do, you know, we've been taught this myth of the to do list that if you just write things down, right, then you can get everything done. Just write it down, then a magical productivity fairy will <laughs> will fly in and do your tasks for you. Yeah, I right. mean, when you think about it this way, it's ridiculous because sure. most people who use a to do list they experience what I experience day after day you know, maybe two thirds of my to-do list doesn't get done and it gets recycled to the next day and the next day and the next day. That's madness. That's crazy. Why do we do that? Well, the problem with this technique is that what we're doing again is we're reinforcing an identity we don't want. So every day, what I would tell myself, even when I'd have a productive day, I'd say, oh, wow, you know, look, I did 10 things on my to-do list, but then at the end of the day, I've still got 90 more things to do. And so I'm reinforcing my identity that I lied to myself again and again. Another day I said I was going to do all this stuff and I didn't get it done. Instead, what we want to do is to use a technique called time boxing. Time boxing has been around for decades. It's been validated in thousands of studies now. It's basically, uh, psychologists call it making an implementation intention. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a template for what our ideal week should look like based on our values. How do we turn our values into time? And so here's the thing. Here's a rule I want everyone to remember is that you cannot call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So if you've got lots of white space in your day, of course you're going to get distracted. You didn't decide what you want to do with your time, right? Sure. So we plan out how we want to spend our day to, down to the minute. Now, does that mean we won't get distracted from time to time? Of course, we're going to get distracted. Does it mean we shouldn't make time for things that aren't necessarily work? Of course, we have these three life domains of taking care of yourself, taking care of other people, and then, of course, taking care of work. But we want to plan time for all of those values. So, and I'm not saying what your value should be, but if you know personal health is important to you, if that's one of your values, 
Do you have time for proper rest and nutrition and exercise? If taking, if time with your family is important to you and your friends, you know, part of the reason we have this loneliness epidemic in this country right now that we, you know, psychologists tell us that, uh, that loneliness is as detrimental to our health as smoking and obesity. Wow. Is. You know, part of the reason this is happening is because all of the social institutions that we used to have are crumbling. Uh, and this is not a new phenomenon. This didn't start with Facebook. This started back, uh, you know, Robert Putnam wrote about this in the early 90s. Uh, when in his book, Bowling Alone, he talked about how Kiwanis Club and the church group and the, little, uh, the, the civic organization, these groups used to hold time on our calendar. Well, now with people attending these groups less, we're more lonely. We don't have that time held on our calendar. So, so we need to bring that time back. We need to have that time on our calendar schedule. And then what we're doing once we have that, that time box calendar, the real magic happens when we sit down with our manager, our boss, our colleagues, even our domestic partner, and we sit down with them and we show them our week ahead. This is called schedule syncing. And I show you exactly how to do this. This is where the magic happens because you know we've all heard that if you want to stay focused, you have to learn how to say no. But that's really hard. How do you tell your boss no? So don't tell your boss no. Get your boss to tell you no. How do you do that? You show your boss your time box calendar and you do a schedule sync. So you show them the calendar for the week ahead and you say, hey, here's how I'm going to spend my time this week. Here's the stuff. You see this list over here on the separate page? These are things that I won't have time for. Is there anything on that list that you think I should reprioritize? There will always be something your boss wants you to reprioritize and they will worship the ground you walk on if you do this for them because they're not going to ask you to do it because they don't want to seem like they're micromanaging you. But this is how we manage up. This is how we manage our managers. It's an incredibly effective technique, not only with your boss, but with your spouse, your significant other. It saved my marriage, this simple technique. Wow. This connects with me a lot. I have a book actually coming out January 1 called The Energy Clock, and it's all about how do we align our our energy, right, which is sort of what you're talking about, the things that matter most to us with, with our time so that we have the energy for the things, obviously, that matter most. So this time boxing is, I love it. It's very cool. Uh, what you're talking about here is powerful. And, and third, you talk about hack back external triggers. You know, when, when most people think about distractions, I think they probably kind of go to work, right? They think about their work, you know, the meetings, the emails, right? The, the interruptions. So let's take it from a leader's perspective first. How can we ensure that we are part of the solution as leaders, not the problem? So one of the things you can do is, is implement uh, this, this time box calendar, by the way, with your colleagues. Maybe share the book with folks so that they understand how important it is as a hint that you would like them to do this with you, uh, this time box ca- uh, calendar process. It's very, very effective. The next step, the third step is to hack back the external triggers. So the external triggers, again, are the ping, dings, and rings, all of these things in our environment that can prompt us towards traction or distraction based on whether we plan to do the thing. So if your phone buzzes and says, hey, now it's time to go to that meeting or now it's time to go to the gym or whatever, that's traction if that's what you plan to do, uh, as opposed to if you're in a meeting and you get a ping or ding or you're working on a big project, well, now it's leading you towards distraction because you're doing something you didn't plan to do. So I systematically go through all the potential distractions. There's eight different uh, things that we can hack back from email. I tell you how to save up to 90%, 90%, percent of the time you spend on email, how to hack back meetings, uh, how to hack back your computer, news feed. I mean, all of these different environments that you have to hack back. Probably the most important is how do we hack back the physical workspace? Because most people today work in some kind of open floor plan office. And while open floor plan offices are good for some things, uh, they save companies a ton of money on real estate, they are hotbeds of distraction. And so I profile in the book how we can hack back distraction in an open floor plan office with a really simple solution. And the solution is called a screen sign. And in fact, every copy of the book, there is this screen sign in the book. It's actually printed inside the book. You pull it out. It's on a special piece of cardstock. You fold it into thirds and you put it on your computer monitor. And it's a bright red sign that says, I'm indistractable at the moment. Please come back later. And it's just a visual signal to tell your colleagues that, look, for the next 45 minutes, an hour, whatever amount of time you need to do your focused work, please do not distract me. Please come back later. It's an incredibly effective technique. So one of the things that you can do as a manager is to set the pace. You know, culture flows downhill. So if you start doing this, if you encourage others to start doing this, this is how we all become indistractable. And of course, we're not going to leave that screen sign up all day. But here's the thing. Whenever I give a talk or a workshop, I give many of them, I'll always ask people, 
you know, how many of you need to think in your day? How many of you need focused work time? Every hand goes up. And then I ask, well, how many of you have that time reserved on your calendar and protect that time? Maybe one or two hands. And the fact of the matter is, if you need time to think, you have to protect it. You know, we think about how we protect our, our stuff. We have uh, home security systems and alarms on our cars, and we put our money inside vaults and banks. But when it comes to our time and attention, <laughs> yeah, sure, come by my desk. Steal as much so as you want. So true. So right? true. And so this is a very simple technique that we can use that's, that's been shown to be highly, highly effective. And so how do you handle email? You know, things, I mean, those just flow in all day, all the time. How do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah. So email is a big one. The email is a bane of, of everyone's existence. It's the mother of habit forming technology. And I'm telling you as an insider, uh, you know, that the email taps all of the psychological buttons to keep you engaged. Uh, so what we have to do with email is first and foremost, we have to plan time in our day to check email. Even if, by the way, I don't care how often you check email, but I want you to plan that time. What I don't want you to do is to habituate yourself to check email whenever you're feeling stressed anxious, uncertain, a lack of agency and control. We keep reaching for email. Let's face it, like babies with a pacifier. We keep sucking on our, on, on our binkies all day, on our <laughs> devices, because we feel uncomfortable. And so we have to break that habit. It shouldn't be led based on internal triggers. We should check our email when we decide, not when somebody else decides, or not when we feel uncomfortable. So the first thing is to put time on your calendar. So if you're, if you're in a very reactive job, right, where you're constantly reacting to email, that's fine. Say, okay, I'm going to work for 60 minutes and then I'm going to check email for 15 minutes, whatever it's going to be, but plan that time in advance. Then what you want to do when you check email, you see the problem with email from a time study perspective, the place we waste the most time on email is not the checking or the responding. Where we waste time on email is the rechecking. That's a big fat waste of time. And Got this it. is what it looks like, right? I used to do it all, all the time. To open an email, read it, put it away. Open an email, read it, put it away. Open an email, read it, put it away. And then, you know, later on in the day, you check it and check it and recheck it. That's a big waste of time. So instead, every email we only touch two times. The first time we get that email, we want to ask ourselves the only question that matters from a time management perspective is when does it need a reply? When does it need a reply? Then, if we can sort into a few categories, if it never needs a reply, we'll then just delete it. Okay. If it needs a reply, oh my God, right this minute, hair on fire type of problem. Well, then you have to reply right now. That's, that's an emergency, but that's only maybe 1% of your emails. If we're honest, all the other emails, 99% of the rest of the emails will fall into two categories, either emails that need a reply today or emails that need a reply sometime this week. Now I know David Allen and, and getting things done say, if something takes two minutes, then just do it. I don't agree. That does not work with email. Here's why. Lots of emails take two minutes. So does that mean that I'm going to do an email after an email after an email and the email? Now I'm checking, now I've spent an hour on emails <laughs> right. on, on two minutes apiece. So do not reply to emails in the moment. You, what you want to do is categorize the emails into either today or this week. Then you have time on your calendar only to reply to the urgent emails. That's going to be about 20% of your email load is just going to be emails that really do need a reply today. Then here's where the magic happens. All of those other emails, the 80% of emails that can get, have a reply sometime this week, you want to book a big old block of time sometime in your week. So for me, I call it message Mondays when I have three hours to work through those emails that can wait. Now, here's the, the cool thing. You know, many people at this point are thinking, well, what's the point of that? I'm just delaying when I'm going to reply to these emails. Why don't I just reply to them as they come? There's a certain type of magic that happens when we let email simmer. And you will find that about 50 to 75% of those emails that you think need to reply sometime this week magically don't need to reply anymore. People will figure out their own issues. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the something will get crushed under the weight of some other priority. Uh, people, you know, so what happens is that, that these emails start to shrink in importance if you give them a little time to simmer. And if they're still urge, if they still need a reply, well, you get to them at the end of the week. Because here's the math on how this works. If you want to receive fewer emails every day, <laughs> you have to send fewer emails every day. Sure. So if you're constantly playing this ping pong game with no sense of priority in terms of when does an email need a response, of course you're going to be inundated with email every day because people play this ping pong game and want to return every email they get. But that just makes the problem worse. I'm sure. So in fact, inbox zero can in fact backfire. 
because, you know, okay, great. You cleared inbox zero and you sent out a hundred emails. Well, guess what? You're going to get a hundred responses right back. <laughs> so it never works. Instead, only send reply to the emails that are today and then schedule time for those less urgent emails sometime this week. And then you'll find that many of those emails don't even need a reply at all. That's powerful. And I've heard you talk about notifications, right? That so many people don't turn these notifications off. So part of this process, I would imagine you're, you're suggesting that we, we turn off these notifications so these aren't pinging us constantly in real time. Right. So the idea behind hacking back, you know, I use the term hack back because to hack means to gain unauthorized access. When we talk, think about computer hackers, that's what that means. But here's the thing, as powerful as these companies and technologies are, there's nothing they can do if we hack back. So I show you how to change the technology to serve you as opposed to you serving it. Yeah. So I'll show you how to hack back your news feeds, how to hack back uh, the, the, your devices to make sure that they're not constantly potentially distracting you. Not that these devices are bad. You know, a lot of tech critics out there, it's all gloom and doom. It's all technology is awful. It's melting your brain. I think that's rubbish. We don't have to go on a digital detox. We don't have to stop using our tech for 30 days. Most of us would get fired if we even tried. So instead, what we want to do is to use these tools in a way that serve us as opposed to us serving them. Sure. There's only a few people that I know of that can can throw there. I was I was playing a practice run. I was walking a practice run with one of my PJ Tour players once, actually, Matt Kuchar, and we were walking and his phone just kept dinging and dinging and dinging and he was trying to play his practice round and he got so frustrated. I mean, this was a few years, several years ago, but he just picked up his phone and threw it to the lake yeah. and said, I'm done. <laughs> and we, I, I mean, there's not very many people that can roll like that, yeah. but uh, it lasted about a month, I think. And then he, and then he bought a new one, but um, I think he had a month of reprieve. We have these amazing tools now and technologies that help us hack back. For example, yeah, for sure. a function I use on my iPhone all the time is called do not disturb while driving. Right. Very few people use it. It's built into every iPhone these days with the new iOS update. I think it comes on Android as well. You push one button, and if anyone calls or texts you, they receive an auto reply that says, I'm driving right now, but if this is urgent, text me the word urgent. Now, you can customize that message any way you like. So mine, when I have Do Not Disturb While Driving on, it says, I'm indistractable right now. If this is urgent, text the word urgent. And if the person types in the word urgent, the message will come through. Mm. So he could have pushed one button and saved himself his phone. <laughs> yeah. And guess what? Only if his house was on fire and someone really needed to call him would the call or text come through. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So part four is about power of PACs. So how can we use PACs to prevent distraction? So PACs are the final step. It's the fail-safe to make sure that after you've done the three other things, made to, uh, uh, master internal triggers, make time for traction, hack back external triggers, the fourth and final say, uh, step, the, the real fail-safe to this methodology is what we call a pact. So a pact is a promise we make to ourselves or to others to prevent us from getting distracted. And there's three types of pacts. We have what's called an effort pact, which is some kind of friction, some kind of work we put in between us and our distractions. Uh, so this can be, you know, I, I describe many technologies in the book that can help us do this. Uh, there's there's many apps these days. Many, most of them are absolutely free that we can use that help block out distractions. So I use on my uh, on my phone, I use an app called Forest. And every time I want to do focused work, I open this app. I dial in how much time I want to do focused work for. And when I do that, uh, I hit a button called Plant, and a little virtual tree is planted. Now, if I do anything with my phone and pick up my device and want to do anything with it, the virtual tree dies. Now, it's just a little reminder to remind you, okay, that's not what you want to do. If you made a promise with yourself, don't break that promise or the, or the virtual tree gets it. <laughs> so it's just a very convenient little reminder. So that would be an effort pact. What is that app? It's called Forest. Forest. Cool. Okay. Right, right. Another pact is called a price pact where we have some kind of monetary disincentive to becoming distracted. And then finally, the last technique is called making an identity pact. And an identity pact is probably the most effective of the three. This is, again, back to what we said earlier around how long-term behavior change is identity change. It turns out that this comes from the psychology of religion, that when we have a certain identity, uh, whether that's I'm an observant uh, Christian or a devout Muslim or, or even a vegetarian, when we have an identity, a moniker that we call ourselves, we become much more likely to not do what we don't want to do. So, for example, um, a vegetarian doesn't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I wonder if I should have some bacon. Right? That's just not what they do. They're vegetarians. They don't eat meat. So if we can make an identity pact with ourselves around becoming indistractable, that's very powerful. Uh, and the good news is we, we've actually been here before. I remember when I was a kid, I grew up in the early 80s. And I remember as a kid when people would come over to our house, 
we had these ashtrays all over our house. Now, my parents didn't smoke, and yet we had ashtrays. Why? Because back in the early 80s, when someone came to your house, they just expected to light up a cigarette in your living room. Wow. Today, that would be crazy. Who would do that today, right? That, that would be incredibly rude for someone to do that. So what changed? There's never been a law that says you can't smoke in someone's living room. What changed was that people like my mother one day decided to get rid of the, the ashtrays and told people, her friends, you know, when they would come over and they expected to smoke, or just, just as soon as they were about to take out their lighter, she would say, oh, I'm sorry, we're not smokers. If you want to smoke, please go outside. And let me tell you, she lost friends over this, right? This was like very rude to ask someone to go smoke outside back then. Of course, now nobody would dream of smoking in your living room. Well, what changes that people stood up and said, nope, this is not who I am. I am a non-smoker. And today we need to stand up and say, I am indistractable. Got it. Yeah, I do a, a few weird things. I keep a time box calendar. I use this strange screen sign. Is that anything different from someone having an unusual diet or wearing unusual religious garb? No. So what I want to help do is to start this movement to people who say, I control my time, I control my attention, I control my life because I am indistractable. Mm -hmm. and, and this is, I know there's been a ton of research that's gone into writing this book. I think five years in the making, in fact. Tell me about that. Yeah, so, so this was very much a book I wrote for me, first and foremost, <laughs> that yeah. I found I was getting increasingly distracted. And, and this happens to a lot of people, particularly when they become uh, successful. So when my first book, uh, Hook, did so well, and it sold uh, 250,000 copies, now I started getting more speaking opportunities and consulting engagements. So ironically, the thing that made me successful as an author now distracted me from continuing to write. And this happens with a lot of folks as they become increasingly successful, they have less time to continue to do the things that made them successful in the first place. Right. Sure. And so the, the, this was a problem that was very palpable for me. I would get distracted in my work with my family. You know, They paid the price. My health, I wouldn't exercise. I wouldn't uh, eat right. And it was all basically the same exact problem of why am I not doing what I said I would do? And that's what becoming indistractable is all about. It's about striving to live with personal integrity. So we end with rapid fire. You've been generous with your time. I'm going to fire off some questions and you just tell me uh, what comes up. Okay. All right. You a morning person or a night owl? Uh, I don't believe in the concept. <laughs> what? <laughs> because, uh, yeah. So the, the research actually shows that you are what you are based on what you believe. That the research is actually a little bit shaky on whether that actually uh, there are such types of, of personalities. And in fact, you are whatever you believe you are. And so I try and not bucket myself into those categories. Have you had this conversation with Daniel Pink about his book, When? Yeah, we need to have a conversation. You know, the research is always changing and, you know, the scientific process is that sometimes uh, research is overturned or studies can't replicate. And so uh, I actually talk about this in my book around how to reimagine your temperament mm -hmm. with this whole idea of, of willpower, that we're increasingly seeing that yeah. willpower and this idea that, you know, you run out of willpower, it's bunk. It's actually the studies don't replicate. Don't you think that we're intrinsically a little bit wired for one or the other? You know, the research is kind of shaky. I'm not, I'm not convinced. And, and, you know, even if there is such a phenomenon, here's the problem with it. That, and this, this comes from the work of Carol Dweck around her work with mindset, that when you believe you're a morning person, what happens when you have to get something done in the evening? Yeah, You're actually psyching yourself up. We know that the placebo effect and the nocebo effect is very powerful, and you can really change your performance based on what you believe. So I argue, is this helpful? I'm not sure it is helpful. And, yeah. and so what we want to do is to make sure that our beliefs – serve us as opposed to many of us, unfortunately, we serve our beliefs. Mm -hmm. Sure. Introvert or extrovert? Uh, I'm more of an introvert. That, by the way, those five criteria, the ocean around openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, yeah. neuroticism, those are actually pretty, there is a lot of solid science around those. <laughs> <laughs> what was your first job? Uh, my first job, uh, well, I used to, you know, as a kid, I would wash cars uh, in my condo complex. So that's the first way I made money that I remember. But my first job was as an AmeriCorps volunteer after college. I, uh, I worked for AmeriCorps in Atlanta yeah. uh, as an AmeriCorps volunteer. What's your favorite book? My favorite book of fiction is Moby Dick. Uh, speaking of distraction and internal triggers and, you know, this struggle of wanting, and, uh, there's just a lot in that book that is so relevant, uh, this great American novel that's so relevant today in terms of of how sometimes our uncomfortable emotional sensations drive us to do things we later regret. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite app? 
Okay, so in addition to um, uh, self control, forest, um, I, I I love using these. There's many fitness apps that I use today. So FitBot is a great app that I I use quite a bit. Is, is another great one. What what is it called? I'm sorry, you broke up. Oh sure, FitBod. F I T B O D. FitBod. Got it. Okay. What is one thing on your bucket list? One thing on my bucket list. Uh, I would love to go to Egypt. I've never been. I would love to go. That's awesome. It's amazing when I ask that question, most people's answer is travel, right? Somewhere that they want to <laughs> want to go. Yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah. So the show is called Game Changers. So who's a game changer that has inspired you in your life and why? I've always really been inspired by Richard Feynman. Mm. Um, I think his his idea of, of um, questioning uh, what you know, starting from first principles, uh, before Elon Musk made it cool. <laughs> I think uh, he's been very inspiring. I think Paul Graham, uh, he actually, I wrote, I, I read his book, Hackers and Painters, before I started writing, and his style of writing was always very inspirational to me. And I, I always wanted to give people a similar to his work. That's awesome. Nir, thanks so much for coming on. I, I, uh, I am going to work to become more indistractable, and I'm downloading this app, Forest. It sounds pretty cool, and I, I candidly, I think I need it. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show, and uh, yeah, I appreciate it very much. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Nier on how to be indistractable. Here are three of my favorite takeaways from this episode. Number one, the root cause of distraction is internal triggers, not external triggers. Number two, don't prioritize the urgent at the expense of the important. And three, reimagine your to-do list. Practice time blocking instead to turn your values into time. What are your favorite takeaways? Share them with me on social and tag at Molly Fletcher and at Nir Eyal. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.